Famously known as the most accomplished paranormal investigator in the history of the world, Hellboy, aka Anang Un Rama, has led a fascinating life right from childbirth. Created by Mike Mignola, Hellboy first appeared in Dime Press Comics in 1993, where he was discovered by U.S. soldiers as a demonic infant with a gigantic stone hand. He was soon taken in by Professor Broom, who played an integral role in his life and even named him. As his story arc unfurled, we learn that he was the love child of none other than the demon Azale and the witch Sarah Hughes, and that he was destined to bring about the end of the world. Also known as Anang Unrama, or the Harbinger of the Apocalypse, Hellboy refused to passively accept his demonic destiny and instead chose to spend his life fighting evil forces as a living oxymoron. Today, we shall have a look at his entire story arc, ranging from his conception to his time working for the Bureau of Paranormal Research, and tell you all about this character who is endearingly also known as the Right Hand of Doom. Before we go into our explanation, we have a very small request. If you like our content, please support us by subscribing to our channel. This is a small click for you, but for us, it means a lot. Thank you. Let's begin. It's a boy. Anang Unrama's Early Years, The Origin Story of the Hellboy Born to Azale and Sarah Hughes, Hellboy's conception was quite a historic moment in itself, and he was conceived on Valpurgis Night in 1574. Sarah Hughes seemingly hailed from a long line of witches, and she decided to marry Azale at the young age of 16, unaware of the fact that she might come to regret this decision one day. She went on to have two human kids alongside Hellboy, and in 16, 1917, Sarah repented her actions in front of her human children while taking her last breaths. She further instructed them to keep her chained to her coffin for at least three nights, or else Azale might be able to claim her and drag her to hell for eternity. While Sarah's children tried their best to protect her, Azale overpowered them and murdered them in cold blood before taking her to hell and engulfing her in flames. While he had been conceived ages ago, it was this action that finally brought him into the world, and Hellboy was born out of these flames as Hell rejoiced in the birth of King Arthur's first male heir in a long time. Hellboy was destined to bring about the apocalypse on Earth, but it wasn't until December 23, 1944, that Grigory Efimovich Rasputin successfully managed to summon him from Hell with some help from the Third Reich. While this took place on a coast in Scotland, Hellboy's body appeared in a fireball in an ancient church in East Bromwich, England, where he was discovered by a legion of U.S. soldiers led by First Sergeant George Whitman. Whitman was one of the most accomplished army personnel during World War II, and as it turned out, a popular psychic named Lady Cynthia Eden Jones had guided him to the ruins of the church. Whitman discovered this child who seemingly had a deformity in the form of a huge rock arm, and he handed this child over to Professor Trevor Bruttenholm from the British Paranormal Society. Bruttenholm, also known as Professor Broom, was unafraid of this unclaimed demon child, and he decided to raise him and give him the name Hellboy. The U.S. government ensured that Broom kept his existence a secret while they honed his skills and trained him to become a paranormal investigator. He was soon taken to an Air Force base in New Mexico, where he spent most of his formative years in the company of Broom and U.S. General Ricker and a dog, Mac. General Ricker and Broom kept his profile low-key, but also exposed him to the world and helped him develop an inquisitive nature. They arranged for him to meet Einstein and Joseph Stalin, among other people, and Hellboy flourished in this environment until Broom was diagnosed with cancer. At this point, Hellboy was curious about his origins and affiliations with the dark side, and struggled with his identity for a long time. By 1952, he had made up his mind about wanting to battle evil on Earth, and he joined the Bureau for Paranormal Research and Defense when he was just eight years old. He went on to become their lead agent, and worked alongside Abe Sapien, Elizabeth Sherman, and Roger over the course of his career. He turned out to be quite a likable person with an easygoing attitude, and there was no shred of evil in his personality despite his demonic origins. However, his origins did help him gain a wide range of powers, such as superhuman strength, 
speed and reflexes, and he also had impressive durability and endurance. Besides having excellent durability, Hellboy had accelerated healing, and it barely took him any time at all to heal from injuries on the rare occasion that he was bested by his opponents. He was also an immortal being who could manipulate Hellfire, perform electrokinesis, and even fly around in his demonic form after sprouting wings. After training for the BRPD, Hellboy gained mastery over fields such as occult knowledge, multilingualism, and strategic planning, and further developed proficiency in combat abilities and superhuman intellect. Let us now have a look at Hellboy's career in the BRPD and all the adventures that he embarked on through the course of his lifetime. Hellboy, A Tale of the Supernatural, The Enigmatic Chronicles of Anang Unrama's Extraordinary Adventures, Hellboy's Early Adventures in the Bureau for Paranormal Research and Defense, BRPD. After deciding to join the BRPD, Hellboy grew into a fine young man, but seemingly lacked the maturity that one might expect from an adult. He had the rebellious attitude of a teenager even in his prime, but at the same time, he flourished in his career and became an expert in dealing with the supernatural. He researched topics such as exorcisms, possessions, sacred artifacts, and enchantments, and in no time, he became one of the top field agents in the BRPD. He served under Professor Broom for quite some time during World War II, and it was only after the fall of the Nazi regime that Hellboy garnered the courage to travel the world in pursuit of the supernatural. He faced creatures such as werewolves and vampires, and had an excellent track record in defeating them until he faced Hermann von Klempt, a Nazi scientist who had driven himself to insanity over the years. Much to no one's surprise, Hellboy eventually bested him and moved on to face the Baba Yaga, minor gods, and mythological entities. In 1952, the United Nations bestowed him with honorary human status despite his demonic origins, and in the due course of time, he had to face a challenge that tested his humanity. In this encounter, he was asked to kill an alligator-like entity known as the St. Leonard Worm, and Hellboy sustained a few injuries in the process. While he spilt some blood, Lily started growing out of his blood, and this was the final sign that everyone needed to solidify his human status and virtuous persona. Around 1954, Professor Broom entrusted Hellboy with the responsibility of aiding Professor Aikman with the King Vold myth in Norway. Aikman was determined to secure a possible reward by completing Vold's chosen tasks, and Hellboy was lured into carrying out these missions for him. About five years after this incident, Hellboy went on a mission to Ireland to rescue a baby named Alice Monaghan, and also ensure that a corpse is finally laid down in its resting place. This mission was overseen by the King of the Danishi, who took a liking to Hellboy and continued to follow his adventures in the future. Hellboy continued to make history within the BRPD, and in 1979, he went to assist Mr. Todd, a famous physical medium from yesteryear. When Todd attempted to enter a trance by consuming drugs, he accidentally set a cosmic monster free, and this monster then created a body for itself within Todd's being. Hellboy faced this entity, who revealed itself to be the spirit of Ogdruhem, and soon figured out that he could be defeated with a special herb. After collecting another win, Hellboy's confidence in his abilities only grew stronger, which fueled him to track down the infamous vampire, Countess Ilona Kosicki, and defeat her once and for all. A few years down the line, Hellboy was sent to help another Bureau colleague, Pauline Raskin. This incident took place in 1991, and it followed the BRPD's attempt to investigate a hidden basement that was recently uncovered in a mansion owned by Dr. Karp. Karp used to be a Grand Master at the Golden Lodge, which was essentially a temple for the crazed Heliopic Brotherhood of Ra. While Hellboy believed this brotherhood to be an insane collection of individuals, he ventured into the basement and ended up getting magically warped through time all the way back to 1902. When he landed on his feet, he found himself facing Dr. Karp, who used some of Hellboy's blood to experiment on a chimpanzee and turn him into a sadistic, feral monster. 
Hellboy's adventures continue, the Cavendish Hall Affair. While we have glanced at some of Hellboy's initial adventures with the BRPD, it wasn't until the Cavendish Hall mission that Hellboy's abilities were put to the test. This mission was one of the most dangerous adventures of his lifetime, and it posed a threat to not just him, but his fellow companions, such as Abe Sapien and Elizabeth Sherman. The entire saga began when Professor Broom sought Hellboy's company and tried to confide in him, but he was unfortunately killed off by a bunch of frogs who appeared out of nowhere. When an enraged Hellboy tried to process his guardian's death, he faced a strange humanoid frog monster and channeled all his rage into this duel. While this fight was subdued, Hellboy was determined to find out what exactly Broom wanted to tell him moments before his death, and he decided to travel to the haunted Cavendish Hall Manor. He hoped that Mrs. Cavendish would know what Professor Broom was distressed about, especially since that was the last thing he mentioned before the frogs barged into the room. Abe and Elizabeth accompanied Hellboy on this mission while we got some context into Mrs. Cavendish's lore. As it turned out, she was a widow who had lost her son in an excursion to the Arctic, and Professor Broom was also present on this mission as they tried to locate a temple in the middle of nowhere in the Arctic. Mrs. Cavendish stated that a great curse was bestowed upon every man in her family, and that every last one of them got obsessed with getting something from the Arctic and almost always lost their lives in the process. However, the truth seems to be far from this, and it is revealed that the Cavendish men had managed to find this temple with some help from Professor Broom. They even encountered Grigori Rasputin, who was stuck in hibernation after being chained to a cosmic monstrosity named Ogdru Jihad. Jihad was trying to enter the human plane through Rasputin's body, and his plan was to trigger an apocalypse on Earth. When the Cavendish men lurked around the temple, they accidentally awakened the spirit of one of the dormant Ogdru Hem known as Sadu Hem. All the challenges that Hellboy encountered in the aftermath of his victory at Cavendish Hall. After returning from Cavendish Hall, Hellboy embarked on several adventures with his partners, and we shall look at some of the most notable ones. To begin with, Hellboy and Kate Corrigan got wind of a town that was being destroyed by ghosts of werewolves in 1994, and they actually got wind of this incident after one of Hellboy's associates, Father Kelly, was murdered by one of the living werewolves. The following year, Hellboy traveled to Scotland to visit the site of his first appearance, where he had a dream vision of his parents and the way he came into being. As he continued to undertake newer missions, Hellboy found himself in Lazara, Spain in 1998, where he came across Malcolm Frost's son, Adrian Frost. As they exchanged life stories, Adrian helped Hellboy realize that his stone hand was the key to the apocalypse, and that he must keep this hand from falling into the wrong hands. Hellboy uncovers the true purpose of his life, the Ghiarescu Affair. In 1997, Hellboy traveled to Romania on a mission to investigate the theft of Vladimir Ghiarescu's corpse, who was revealed to be a Napoleonic officer turned vampire. An age-old legend revealed that Ghiarescu would fight in several battles and that his servants were tasked with the responsibility of rushing his body back to his castle in the event that he succumbed to his injuries. While he died numerous times, the rays of the full moon would reach him in his castle, and he managed to return to life in no time after every single battle. Ghiarescu lived a noble life until 1882, when he started conjuring an elaborate plan to dominate England by posing as a foreign nobleman and then making his way to the top. However, his actions soon caught the eye of the Nazi party, who sent a team led by Ilse Hauptstein to recruit Ierscu to work for them. However, the vampire refused to live on anyone else's terms, and the meeting went horrendously as Hitler ordered his arrest and even murdered Ierscu's brides when he refused to join their cause. Ierscu and his brides were brutally murdered, beheaded, and then burned to death, after which their ashes were sent to Hitler. One would assume that this would be enough to eradicate Ierscu, but things took a turn for the worse 
worse when a crate containing his corpse was stolen from Hans Ubler's Nazi museum in 1997. It was suggested that Ubler allegedly stole Girescu's corpse and stored him away for decades, while Hitler was under the impression that the vampire had been burned to death. Unfortunately for Ubler, his secret was not well kept, and Girescu's followers soon got wind of this and decided to free their master. Led by Ilse Hauptstein, these beings barged into Ubler's museum, shot him to death, and got their hands on Girescu's corpse. The next step in their plan was to take him back to Castle Girescu to revive him under a full moon. But there was a tiny hole in their plan, as they did not really know where the castle was located. When Hellboy and Kate Corrigan got wind of these occurrences, Kate tried to guess possible locations, and BRPD agents were dispatched to each of these spots to investigate. Hellboy was sent to one of these sites, and he reached it just in time to find out that Ilsa had already begun prepping for the resurrection ritual. In the meantime, Rasputin's banished spirit chose this exact moment to return to Hellboy, and he also used his abilities to turn Ilsa into a reincarnation of goddess Hecate. When Hellboy attempted to put a stop to Ilsa's, or Hecate's, plan, she used her newfound abilities to defeat him and chain him to a pole. Hellboy could sense that he might end up dying here, but things took a turn for the better when Ilsa resurrected Giersku, who seemed to have lost his fierce spirit after years of inactivity. When Giersku tried to charge at Hellboy, the latter cracked the pole into two to free himself and then proceed to strike down Giersku's horse. Ilsa was bewildered to see Hellboy lash out like this, and she used her abilities to banish him to an alternate dimension. When Hellboy made sense of his surroundings, he came to a bunch of entities that claimed to be chaos itself. They insisted that it was time for Hellboy to embrace his destiny as Anan Urama, and his sawed-off horns somehow started sprouting on his head along with a crown of fire. However, Hellboy's ironclad will helped him resist this transformation, and he snapped these horns off his head and reaffirmed his dedication to the good cause. His act of defiance helped him return to the normal world, where he was greeted by Kate Corrigan. Kate revealed that the entire incident was a plot devised by Rasputin and that the other teams had also run into trouble while trying to locate the castle. Rasputin was trying to exact revenge and punish Abe for stabbing him at Cavendish Hall. And Kate further told Hellboy that the BRPD had gotten their hands on Girescu's corpse. Hellboy and Kate's Encounter with a Homunculus While a homunculus is essentially a tiny humanoid creature, it's capable of doing great harm and one of them once attacked Liz Sherman, which resulted in her losing her powers. Meanwhile, Hellboy and Kate looked into the disappearance of a few corpses and a cross, and a shocking turn of events revealed that the culprit was the same homunculus that had attacked Liz. The creature was trying to get God to kill him, but it soon came across its older brother, who told him all about their creator's plans to overthrow humanity. While this homunculus duo started operating from a lair, Kate and Hellboy tracked them down to their base and ventured into this unknown territory, where Kate ended up getting captured. While she was soon freed, the older homunculus used his brother's body to create a giant monster and then used him to attack Hellboy. Fortunately, the younger creature snapped out of his current state and switched sides to turn on his brother and help the BRPD agents get to safety, even at the cost of his own life. Hellboy and the Little Box of Evil In 1999, Hellboy and Abe ventured into unknown territories to investigate an attack and found themselves at the castle of Count Guarino. Meanwhile, warlock Igor Bromhead released a demonic entity named Wallach, who had been trapped within a box for eternity. When Wallach was finally freed, he told Bromhead all about Hellboy's true identity as Anang Unrama, and even temporarily stunned him. He then claimed the crown of the apocalypse that had been invisibly placed upon Hellboy's head the entire time, and also tried to steal Hellboy's stone hand. While Hellboy was cornered, Dana Shi came to his rescue and helped him break free from Wallach's paralyzing attack. Meanwhile, a demonic entity named Astaroth came across Bromhead and Wallach, who had Hellboy's crown with them. Astaroth dragged them both to Hell along with the crown, leaving Hellboy free on Earth once again when Hellboy had to stop a demonic worm from wreaking havoc on Earth. Known as one of the most defining moments of Hellboy's career, 
The Conqueror Worm Affair focused on his encounter with a cosmic entity. While Roger and Abe Sapien from the BRPD assisted him, Hellboy faced this entity that had bonded with a Nazi scientist after floating around in space for eternity. Now that this monster had finally arrived on Earth, we learn that he was allegedly related to Ogdru Jihad, a terrifying being who had been looped in to help the Nazis back in the 40s. In the present day, Grigori Rasputin was the one controlling this monstrous worm when Roger the homunculus stepped up to get rid of it, even if it meant sacrificing himself while trying to trap the worm's spirit within its body. Hellboy rushed to Roger's rescue and managed to scare away the worm's consciousness while helping an injured Roger. While the BRPD agents rushed to Roger's aid, they advised Hellboy against getting too friendly with him and even advised him to kill him in case he posed a danger to them in the future. Hellboy was quite conflicted over this, and with a heavy heart, he resigned from the BRPD if it meant that he could refrain from killing Roger. Hellboy's Solo Adventures After Departing from the BRPD After being a part of the BRPD for the longest time, it was time for Hellboy to discover the world and carve his own identity. He first decided to travel to Africa in 2004, where he encountered a witch doctor, Molomi. As Hellboy explored the place, the spirits warned him that he only had one last night to spend in their land, and Molomi then came to his rescue and took him to the coast. She claimed that the sea was calling out to him, and unsurprisingly, a mermaid trio captured him soon after and drove a magic nail through his forehead to prevent him from escaping. He was then escorted to a sea witch known as Bog Roosh, who was determined to eradicate any possibility of an apocalypse in the future. Bog Roosh believed that the way to go about this was to dismember Hellboy and then hide his right hand of doom, and she happily granted the mermaid's wishes in exchange for Hellboy. While two of these mermaids ended up dying due to their wishes, the third one lived on and she had a noble wish and only wanted her deceased father's spear. When she procured the spear, her father's ghost returned to her and helped her realize that she had endangered an innocent man in her attempt to restore her father's honor. This guilt tripped her into returning to Bogrush's lair to rescue Hellboy, who had managed to kill the evil witch in the meantime. As it turned out, Hellboy had figured out that Bogrush was deriving her power from the souls of drowned sailors, and he soon defeated her only for the third mermaid to replace her as the new Bogrush. However, she showed some kindness to Hellboy and removed the magical nail from his forehead in an attempt to free him. Hellboy did find some relief, but he was soon plunged into a coma, and it took him about two years to finally surface on a coast. When he finally got back on his feet, Hellboy ended up resurrecting a mystic and stumbled across the secrets of the universe. The mystic then used his blood to resurrect Ergo Hem who lashed out at Hellboy and killed him in the blink of an eye. However, Ergo Hem did not think this through, and it slipped his mind that Hellboy was an immortal being who soon returned to life and defeated him. At this point, one would assume that Hellboy has been through enough, but this was not the end of his sufferings, as he had to face Hecate another time and defeat her before moving on from this place. Hellboy's Return to England and Baba Yaga's Revenge In 2007, Hellboy decided to move back to London to stay with his friend Harry Middleton, where a bunch of witches cornered him and dragged him to Italy. After Igor Bromhead defeated the witches' leader, Hecate, they wanted Hellboy to defeat Igor and step up to be their king. However, Hellboy had no interest in getting involved with these witches, and he turned them down, much to their disappointment. While Hellboy moved on from this incident, the witches took his refusal to heart and exacted their revenge by handing him over to Baba Yaga. Soon enough, Hellboy found himself deep within her Russian dimension, where her minions tortured him. As it turns out, Hellboy had shot her in the eye all the way back in 1964, and Baba Yaga had held on to this incident in the hopes that she might teach him a lesson one day. While she sent her undefeated champion, Kashe the Deathless, to kill Hellboy in exchange for finally granting him the death he desired, Hellboy found allies in the form of of supernatural beings such as Lechi, 
Purin, and a girl named Veselisa. Sadly, Kashe tracked Veselisa down and killed her, but not before the little girl showed Hellboy the way out of the dimension and even left behind two gifts for him. As Baba Yaga grew more desperate by the minute, she bestowed Kashe with some of her magical powers so that he could finally kill Hellboy. But this process went horribly wrong and left Yaga powerless. When Hellboy made his way out of the dimension, he decided to go after Igor Bromhead, who had supposedly driven himself crazy after siphoning off Hecate's powers. All of this seemed too much for him, and he virtually begged Hellboy to kill him and put him out of his misery, an offer that Hellboy was more than happy to oblige to. Hellboy's encounter with the Wild Hunt and reunion with Alice Monaghan. When the Osiris Club invited Hellboy to join their Wild Hunt in England, he accepted their offer and found himself surrounded by the British elite. As he familiarized himself with these individuals, he learned that a bunch of giants had gone rogue in the British countryside and that the Wild Hunt hoped to get rid of this nuisance. Things seemed to go smoothly, but not for long, as these elites soon showed their true colors and tried to kill Hellboy in order to ensure that someone with demonic origins like him never sits on the throne of England. While all of this was pretty uncalled for, Hellboy found allies in the form of these giants, who killed off every last member of the Wild Hunt. However, he was quite agitated at the fact that the Wild Hunt had tried to assassinate him, and he decided to vent his anger and frustration by attacking these giants. He ended up killing a few of them, and it took him a while to return to his senses and snap out of his murderous rage. Hellboy was quite mortified by his actions, and he ran from this scene and embarked on a journey to Ireland, where he was reunited with Alice Monaghan. Hellboy had first met Alice all the way back in 1963, when he had saved her life from the Fey Folk when she was just a baby. After reconciling, Alice took Hellboy to Queen Mab, who looked into his future and told him that there was only one way for him to escape his hellish destiny. She further warned him that the Queen of Blood, Nimwa, had been resurrected by the Gruwagok of Loch Lean, and that she was all set to rule over the leaderless witches. Moreover, it was Gruagok who had murdered King Dagda to get him out of the way, and he planned to work alongside Nimwa to wage war on humankind by pitting all forms of supernatural beings against humans. When Mab took her leave, Alice and Hellboy processed all this information when they were lured into a trap of goblins. This turned out to be the start of a series of attacks, and then they faced a bunch of bird spirits who lured them to a castle full of demons. Hellboy found himself facing facing a demon knight named Oligos at the castle's entrance, and he defeated him and entered the castle, where he learned that the place was owned by the witch Morgan Le Fay. As Hellboy and Alice approached Morgan Le Fay, they learned that she was a direct ancestor of Hellboy's mother, Sarah Hughes, and that Hellboy had a rightful claim to the throne of England. Morgan brought out the Excalibur and urged Hellboy to pull it out, as this would raise an army of Britain's noble dead, which would help them defeat the Queen of Blood. While Hellboy didn't seem to be in any state to take up such a huge responsibility, Astaroth appeared at the scene and drove Hellboy to pull out the Excalibur, as he believed in an old prophecy that doing this would awaken a sleeping army in Hell. Finally, Veselisa, the young girl from Baba Yaga's revenge arc, appeared at the scene and advised Hellboy to believe in Alice and had enough faith in her to go through with their plan. As this story arc came to an end, Hellboy claimed the Excalibur and pulled it from the stone, an action that directly transported him and Alice to Ireland. Hellboy Faces the Queen of Blood After claiming the Excalibur, Hellboy came across several reports of dead noblemen rising from their graves, and he was even attacked by strange monsters sent by the Queen of Blood. While Hellboy and Alice tried to catch some rest, Nimwa started gathering her army, and subsequently, an army of the noble dead rose outside the tavern, waiting for Hellboy's command to go to war. However, Hellboy dismissed them and decided to face Nimwa all alone despite despite Astaroth's snide remarks about him rejecting his destiny. The new Baba Yaga soon appeared at the scene and helped Hellboy surpass Nimwa's monster army at the cost of an eye so that she could finally have her revenge. Finally, Hellboy made his way
way to Nimwa's tower just as Ogdru Jihad possessed her and turned her into a dragon, and things got too real too fast. As a raging storm thundered over his head, Hellboy prepared himself for the battle of a lifetime and lunged at Ogdru Jihad and the dragon. He ended up losing to the dragon, and Veselisa appeared at the scene and handed him a sword that was carved out of Nimwa's crown. In the meantime, Alice located a World War I soldier and handed him Excalibur so that he could use the Holy Grail to resurrect an army and lead them to a battle against Nimwa's forces. As a full-fledged battle unfurled right beneath Nimwa's tower, Mab's spirit guided Alice towards Hellboy, who seemed to be fighting Ogdru Jihad in an attempt to delay the apocalypse. Alice rushed to the scene, and she arrived just in time to witness Hellboy's victory as he defeated them both. But not not for long, as Nimwa's ghost appeared out of nowhere and tore his heart apart. In a shocking turn of events, Nimwa not only killed Hellboy, but dragged him down to hell with her, while Alice was left in utter shock and despair over her companion's death. Hellboy finds himself in hell. After Hellboy allegedly crumbled to dust, his heart fell through a dark space, and Hellboy apparently grew out of this heart and landed in the abyss, also known as the Outer Ledge of Hell. He was soon introduced to Sir Edward, who told him about his whereabouts while a brute monster named Elagos jumped on him from out of nowhere. While Hellboy had to muster up whatever little strength he had left to battle Elagos, Sir Edward helped him in his fight and even teleported him to safety, which was the last we heard of him. Listen, Sammy, I'm not a very good shot, but the Samaritan here uses really big bullets. Demonic Triumph Hellboy's Cinematic Odyssey While Hellboy's comic chronicles have entertained us on paper, his popularity drove production houses to develop Hellboy movies, beginning with the 2004 Guillermo del Toro film where his character was played by Ron Perlman. This movie followed Hellboy's original comic origins and then showed him as a paranormal investigator who had to battle an army of semile creatures before they conquered humanity. It also explored Hellboy's resistance to temptation as a resurrected Rasputin tried to lure him into embracing his destiny as the Harbinger of Death. This film was followed by a sequel, Hellboy 2 The Golden Army, which was released in 2008. The sequel focused on Hellboy's adventures as he faced a new threat in the form of fairy tale creatures who had been rebelling against humankind. An animated Hellboy film was released in 2019, wherein David Harbour played the titular role in the absence of Ron Perlman and Guillermo del Toro's involvement. Harbour was pretty enthusiastic about this role, and his portrayal of this character is much more dramatic and gritty than Perlman's Hellboy, as his character faces the mighty Nimwa. However, Perlman did voice this character in a couple of feature-length animated films, such as Hellboy Sword of Storms and Hellboy Blood and Iron. Sword of Storm follows Hellboy's adventures in a strange Japanese world after he touches a mysterious sword and finds himself in a foreign land surrounded by demons such as thunder and lightning. While the BRPD tries to subdue one of these dragons that has made its way to the real world, Hellboy himself faces obstacles while escaping this strange land and making his way back to reality. These movies were based on Dark House Comics' Hellboy miniseries, and another one of the movies, titled Blood and Iron, sheds light on Professor Broom and Hellboy's combined effort to defeat a vampire. After the release of Hellboy Blood and Iron, another short film titled Hellboy Iron Shoes was released in its aftermath. This short story was released alongside Blood and Iron as a bonus short in the film's DVD release. Later, Hellboy appeared in an episode of Garfield of My Dreams, I Hate My Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, wherein he appeared in a commercial for a product known as the Left Hand of Doom. The commercial follows a young boy who wants a pair of scissors, while Hellboy insists that he's better off with the arm. A third feature-length film film titled Hellboy the Phantom Claw has been in the works for a while, but there have been no updates on it in recent times. 
The Infernal Quest, Hellboy's Legendary Adventures in Video Games. After conquering the cinematic world, Hellboy has inspired a bunch of video games such as Hellboy The Science of Evil and Hellboy Asylum Seeker, and even made guest appearances in games such as Injustice 2. Hellboy Asylum Seeker marked his first video game appearance on PlayStation 1. This game was also called Hellboy Dogs of the Night, and it was set in 1962 in the aftermath of the disappearance of Peter Johnson. After Johnson went missing in an asylum in Czechoslovakia, Hellboy was sent to track him down. But sadly, this game was not well received by the audience due to poor graphics. Over time, Hellboy gained more popularity as a comic book character, and another video game titled Hellboy The Science of Evil was released ahead of a movie release. This video game followed Hellboy's adventures with Abe Sapien and Liz Sherman as they tried to stop Hermann von Klempt from taking over the world. While these games were centered around Hellboy, he made guest appearances in Blue Mammoth Games' Brawlhall game as well as the NetherRealm Studios' Injustice 2. In this game, Hellboy is voiced by Bruce Barker and is seemingly brought to the DC Universe by Brainiac so that he can be a part of his collection. After Hellboy manages to defeat Brainiac, his popularity skyrockets and several individuals try to recruit him, but to no avail. After basking in glory for some time, Hellboy decides to head back to his universe and eventually retire and settle down in Africa. Hellboy is all set to appear in the upcoming Web of Word video game by Good Shepherd Entertainment, where his character has been voiced by the late Lance Reddick. Marvelous Verdict Hellboy's origins and character development arcs are super fascinating to say the least, and he appears to be a true inspiration to us all. From his decision to defy all odds and reject his destiny, to his determination to work hard to become a top-notch paranormal investigator, Hellboy has attained icon status among comic book characters, and it's no surprise that he has such a vast fan following. And if you liked our content, don't forget to leave a like and subscribe to us if you haven't already. Have a good one, and be safe. Thanks, everyone. Oh, no. Didn't I kill you already? Oh, no.